We're here on The Creators on Shaw TV. I'm David Hawks, and I'm here today with Reese Fulber. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Awesome. Really great. Um, well, a little backstory about your career. You worked with uh, David Foster. You're a member of Delirium, Frontline Assembly. You worked with Fear Factory, Motley Crue, I believe. Uh, I did one little thing with them. Right. It was small. It was my first. It was like the first thing I got hired to do that wasn't like being part of Frontline Assembly. It was the first time I got hired to be a programmer. Okay. Was when they were working on their, um, I think it was that eponymous album with John Karabi that Bob Rock did. And, and my father knows Bob Rock and from the old days of punk and everything. And yeah, and I uh, got to go and work with Nikki Six on a song for a few days. And that was my first exposure to like, being a pro, I guess, wow. you know, and then... Uh, and then, yes, you worked with yes? It was the same situation. Um, um, a good friend of mine, Mike Plotnikov, was Bruce Fairburn's engineer and... Who worked with the Cranberries. Yeah, a lot, everybody. And, and um, they needed someone to do some programming and Mike said, oh, I have this friend and he can come down and do it. But this, the sad part of the yes record was it was the record Bruce passed away on, and so it gave everything a really sort of weird, somber tone. It was, uh, it started out being really, wow, I'm working with Bruce Fairburn, this is great, and then he passes away, so it was a little bit of a, a weird situation. Right. But, you know, the dark side of things, I suppose, you know, you also worked with some, uh, you know, in the skinny puppy realm, uh, yeah. the, and within the industrial music, Fear Factory, um, yes. and then sort of popular version, mindless self-indulgence, mm -hmm. things like that, but also Nail Bomb, one of the unsung Na heroes of that sort of genre. Nail Bomb, I just did a live show with them. I didn't work on the record, but when they wanted to do a big, uh, it was a festival called uh, Dynamo in Eindhoven Hall, which was a very big metal festival. Right. And I've been there. I saw yeah, you perform there. They they put together a live band, and I was part of that live band. So it was, and and then it was sort of like a bit of an infamous performance, and um, it's been circulating online for a while. Then they put it out as an album. So I was just kind of part of that. To be honest, the gig actually wasn't that great. <laughs> a lot of things went wrong, but it just sort of kind of you know had some sort of minor legendary status about it. So. And you worked with, um, well, actually, you were on the Tonight Show at one point too. You were oh, doing that was, that was totally bizarre. I was um, because of my connection with Fear Factory. Fear Factory's bassist Christian played live with Cypress Hill because he could play upright bass, right. and so they would have Christian come out and do shows with them. And they were scheduled to be on Leno uh, as part of a Judgment Night Two soundtrack, which was Ronnie Size with Cypress Hill. And right. Christian said, "We need someone to play keyboards," and I'm like. Okay. Ronnie Size, amazing. It was very surreal playing on Leno with Ronnie Size and Cypress Hill. That was really like, didn't see that one coming. No. So, so you're a you're born in Vancouver boy. Grew up born in East Van. Grew up in East Vancouver. And you were very young. You, you started your music career quite at a young age. You left home almost and kind of started your own career. You went, you were touring in Europe at 17 years 18, old? 18, 18 years old? Well, I mean, I, growing up, I grew up in East Van. Our house was right in the heart of East Van. It was a big old craftsman house. Your father owned Profile Studios? Well, before Profile, he had the dining room was a jam space, and he used to jam in there, and, and so there was always instruments in there. So from when I was, like, really young, I started playing drums and was just always around music and equipment and musicians and the whole culture of it. Later first, on... First, mu uh, first instrument was an accordion, right? I actually played drums first, oh, and then I got, it, for some reason, wanted to play accordion, so that's my only keyboard training. And then got back into drums kind of seriously and took lessons and got into playing jazz and stuff. And along those lines, I got to just hang around my dad's old cover band. The keyboard player had a mini Moog, so I got to, thought that was really cool, played around with that. Um, my parents took me to see Kraftwerk when I was like five years old or something, so I had all of this in there. My father had a great record collection. And then when um, punk rock kind of came, my dad started getting into that and he started playing in bands and I used to tag along to some of the all ages shows. Right. Joey from DOA lived next door. I got to go watch them rehearse when I was like 10 years old or wow. something. Amazing. Um, yeah, and then he later built Profile Studios, so I used to just hang around Profile and like help tidy up, vacuum the floor and, and do, and it was, what I got out of Profile wasn't so much learning how to do anything it was more the culture of musicians and studios and 
you know, I figured out all the technical stuff on my own kind of gradually later. It was more like just the culture of music and musicians right. and studios that... You were around it from such an early age, it just was a natural... I don't, I don't, I mean, literally the, the, the stale beer smell of a nightclub, I already knew, you know, when you're in a club in the daytime, I already knew that when I was like, you know, seven or eight years old. So right. you, when I first went on tour with Frontline, in Europe in 1989, I was 18 years old, and it seems like, wow, but I already knew it. It was like, I already know this, yeah. you know, world, so it wasn't anything that foreign already. It kind of keeps your head in the game, you're not too overwhelmed by things? No, I, I already, like, yeah, I know, you know, I, and I'd already been to Europe before with my family, so it wasn't actually that strange. It was like, sort of like, oh yeah, I kind of know this already, so. So, your, your, your family, interesting, you're, you're a cousin of Sean Atlio, the head of chief of First Nations. I know, that's your Canadian you're, factoid there. Yes, your, uh, your father was Ray Fulber, who played with Art Bergman yes. and the Scissors. Yeah, I grew up around those people, you know, like walking, walking into the living room and Art sitting there, you know, hey Art, how's it going? Oh, you know. <laughs> Being Art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then your, your wife is um, Pink Sex bass player. She was a part of Pink's Try This touring cycle and her father is an absolute legend, Don Randy, who the best way I can describe Don Randy is God only knows intro with Beach Boys. That's, you know, he's playing, yes. I mean, everything Phil Spector. He was part of the Wall of Sound with Phil yes. Spector. He's the, wreck, Brothers, the Wrecking yeah. Crew. Yeah, he's part of that, yeah. Um, which was also, and also Frank Sinatra's keyboard player for 20 years. Nancy Sinatra. Nancy Sinatra. Nancy Sinatra. So there you go. So, and then you're now in Los Angeles. Yes. And you have a young son. I do. Who's uh, musically inclined. He, he, he is, but he doesn't know it. Um, he, I know he can play the Star Wars theme on a little synthesizer I gave him, and he can transpose it, but wow. he doesn't quite know what he's doing is actually like a musical mind. Wow. One thing I do with Rex, which is his name, is if I'm working on more of a rock oriented project, if I'm mixing something, something that's a little more energetic, because the music I make is quite you know, ambient and chilled out. Yes. But when I'm working on sort of more like a rock type thing, and I'm, you know, you know, adjusting mixes and I listen to them in the car, often I'll play it for him and say, what do you think of this? Is this, is this, is this good? And he'll be like, yeah, I like this. This one's good. Like, All right, cool. Fresh ears. The freshest and, thing And to someone me. who has no idea about the backstory. It, it's, and, and someone who's, you know, still really young. And it, it's interesting to just hear, because I've, I've have played him stuff where he goes, nah, I don't, I don't really like it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, so, you know, that's an amazing for him because he's, he's directly in response to what you're telling him at home. For the average kid out there who's wanting to think about becoming a creator, somebody to make music, can you give them a little advice or a sort of insight on should they be following their dream? Um, well, I think the most important thing is you, number one, you have to absolutely love it where it's something you would do no matter what. Number two, you really have to work on it. Like all I used to do was play music and then when I got a synthesizer, that's all I used to do was sit there and just, I mean, it really, it, it's, it takes a tremendous amount of focus. It's not something that has a recipe. It's really just something that requires devotion and immersion. And if you can hang around a studio, if you can hang around musicians, all of that, that all helps you just kind of understand the whole thing and listen to lots of different kinds of music. Don't listen to one kind of music. Very important. And you know, take music lessons. Though you, you get a lot out of those things. You don't have to always be self-taught. You can get. There's so many resources to draw from. You know, read books. Just take it all in and absorb yourself in it. it. The only way you get really good at something is by really doing it all the time. Even someone who has uh, amazing natural talent, you still need to develop that talent with the act of doing it. You know, so that's. Immersion is, is, is the thing. If you're really into it, you just, you have to be, you have to get right in there. Keep your eyes on the prize. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So um, you have uh, Conjure One, yes. is, your, is your solo thing, it's on Armada music? Uh, yeah, it's on Armada, it was on Network, and then Network had moved more into publishing. Uh, I actually got to meet Armin von Buren, uh, name drop, celebrity DJ. He liked Delirium, he liked Conjure One, and I had a meeting with him because about possibly working on some music and I was mentioning I was going to maybe look for a new record label and he says you can come to my label, you can do whatever you want. Because you're a music maker, you actually write music which he appreciates, right? Yes, he, 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 yeah, he liked some of the records I made in the past and, and he was like, come to my label, you can do whatever you want. Don't worry about 
being a DJ, don't worry about making dance music, just do your thing. And that was, that was great. So, you know, Conjure One, I, I don't really want to call it a solo project because it's still very collaborative. There's true. guest Sinead vocalists. Sinead O'Connor was on it. Sinead O'Connor at one time was on it. And, I, you know, I have other musicians that contribute. I have different singers on stuff. So it, it is, it's, it's a project. It's, it's, it's me collaborating with different people. There are some purely solo pieces, but the songs most people know are collaborative. So it is sort of a project that over time has developed its own identity that I'm still trying to develop and but at the same time keep it myself and not be too influenced by outside things like not try and be cool every time I maybe update the beats a little bit that's about as far as I go with worrying about and you did our theme for our TV show and I did do the theme for the TV show <laughs> well you know what I'll leave it right there um, right, thanks for having you. a coffee with me thank you very much for being an inspiration to a lot of the people out there that are doing music because truly in Vancouver's music annals you are really a legend even though you don't want to say it but you're blazing paths for many people uh, I appreciate it. I don't know what to say about that I mean I just it's nice when people like what you do that's that's all you can really hope for I guess thanks a lot thank you We're here today with Jason Corbett of Jackknife Sound and Actors. And uh, we're talking with him in his wonderful space where he creates all his great music. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. And uh, we go back quite a while. At least 40 years. At least 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> I watched you in your previous in um, incarnations. You were, in, well, you want to tell a couple people out there, maybe you want to share what you've been doing? I think I first met you when I was playing in the cow punk band Saddle Sores. Yes, yes, that's right. And then Speed to Kill, TV Heart Attack, um, and then now Actors. Right. Yeah. It's quite a journey. And then TV Heart Attack, your more recent one mm -hmm. prior to Actors, you had quite a bit of success with radio and yeah. things like that. But then you, you sort of dissolved that and you decided to go on now with Actors. Well, I, I think the climate of the industry was changing so quickly. And I kind of took a step back and reassessed how I was marketing or just releasing my music. And I realized I'd got away from kind of what I wanted to really be doing and that was connecting with an audience of like-minded people who were into the same stuff I was right so I kind of reinvented what I was doing right inadvertently you know <laughs> and you went to other places that you couldn't have maybe felt like you wanted to go to or is it because you felt restrained and you wanted to just be more solo I think um, the cliche of like making music that you want to hear you know I just kind of was like okay got into the studio started recording and I got really bitten by the bug of like producing, engineering, and, and discovering different ways of um, conveying my emotional uh, intent <laughs> musically, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, and that led me to just uh, the music showing me w what was inside as opposed to like, I'm going to write a three and a half minute pop song and I hope it gets on the radio and I'm going to do a video like this that's going to be really commercial. It was just, it was literally like, there's some songs that I've released with actors that 
have been written, mixed, and I've done the video the next day, and it's been up on YouTube, like in like in a 36-hour period. Right. And it's funny, ironically, perhaps that I feel Actors is resonating with a crowd uh, stronger than what even TV Heart Attack was. Right. People can sense the honesty, maybe. I don't know. Okay, so being an artist, can you speak a little bit about how you how you feel about being an artist and uh, we, we joked before we went on air here about right. um, no more restaurants right you know the old <laughs> once a waiter always a uh, actor kind of thing or once right. an actor always a waiter or something yeah but for you you've you've done really well now you're an artist and you're creating yourself but right which we'll we'll touch on in a moment there's other artists you're dealing with but for you personally to be an artist tell me about the creation process H how hard is it for you to make that leap like from like day job to being a full-time creator yes um, well I think what's important is to give yourself time to develop um, people would say to me <clears throat> like oh when are you gonna make it you know <laughs> especially back you know years ago you know in my 20s like I was thinking like if I don't make it by the time I'm 30 and then I hit 30 and then I was like, if I don't make it by the time I'm 35, and then I started asking myself, what's making it? And what does that entail? And to me, making it was, oh, creating music, releasing music on your own terms, we're, we're, we're in the middle of a music revolution where anybody can make music, release music, and maybe there's not the big signing bonuses of a million dollars or whatever, but you know, you can create something on your laptop and have it on YouTube and on SoundCloud and Bandcamp mm -hmm. and connect with your audiences right away. And not owe the record company down the road for all yeah. that stuff anyway. Yeah, and you know, maybe maybe you're not gonna get rich off that, but you know, if you're creative and, and you keep working at it, y you can really find your audience. Right. I believe that. And, and also, I just wanted to say about that, it's um, like, it, you have to give it time. You know, looking back, if someone said, oh, Jay, you're going to end up owning it, your studio, you know, uh, and, and recording other bands and helping other artists realize their musical potentials and uh, visions, I would have said, oh, you're nuts. Mm -hmm. You're crazy. That's, that's for other people or people who came from money or people who went to school for it. Or, and if I gave up when other people gave up, you know, right. I wouldn't be enjoying my life like, uh, like I am right now. It's a great studio. Oh, thanks. When did you know, did you have the moment when you were a kid, like you talked about London Calling and yeah. David Bowie's Scary Monsters and you're wearing Sons of Freedom uh, shirt, <laughs> you know, artists that come through your life. But when you were a kid, yeah. do you, did you ever have a moment where you went, I want to be a musician or I'm going to, or that's for me, someone else sees someone else doing it and go, that's for me? Right. Can you say something to maybe a kid out there maybe watching now or that might want to do that? I think I was really fortunate. I grew up essentially with my mom, the two of us, and she let me kind of do what I want. You know, she didn't point me in any direction at school. Like she just really gave me a lot of love and support. And um, and the one, it's it's an oddly defining moment. Um, I had for some reason this like little weight set at home. You know, like for kids, like it was from Sears. Right. And it was like this little weight set, like a bar. And it was about that long, maybe. And I can see you never used it. I never used it. <laughs> um, and uh, there was something playing on the radio and I picked up this bar and I remember because I even held it backwards. I don't know why my, my, my <laughs> I held it backwards to how I play guitar, but I pretended to play guitar on it, like the guitar solo. And I just remember my mom stopping what she was doing and looked over at me, she said, do you want to play, learn how to play guitar? And I was like, yeah. And then like, that was like the spark, you know? And like, that was like grade four. Oh my goodness, that's Grade great. five. Wow, yeah. I still remember that, that's fantastic. It was just, it's crystal clear. So right from that moment, you kind of went, that's what I like. Something, yeah, something just was like, music spoke to me. Right, your new video, Bury Me. Yeah. Uh, we were just saying that it's, it looks like a major motion picture. Do you want to tell a bit about the song? We're going to go to the video and we're going sure. to show people this. I guess it hasn't really been shown much, so no. um, this is going to be a, a treat for everybody. Yep. So who worked on it? 
What does it mean? What's the song sort of about for you? Well, um, basically, uh, uh, I uh, had a song that was used in a film, and that director, Scott Matthews, approached me about doing a video. And we kind of went back and forth a little bit. We met up, uh, and I, I was reluctant at first because, again, you're trusting someone with a vision of what you're doing, and that can go really bad. And um, we met. We both. You know, we both enjoyed similar like synth wave music and David Lynch and uh, you know certain just movies and aesthetics. And I, I was like, okay, this guy gets it. And um, he has a company called Photophonic Films. And the more we chatted about it, uh, here's your plug. Yeah, Photophonic Films. <laughs> and then um, uh, it it seemed like a a really good project to get. Uh, uh, my fiance involved with, who is a, a, a fantastic actor, actress, um, named Kira Clavel. And it's the first time where I'm like, okay, this is going to be of the production quality that I feel is deserving for a performance from her. <laughs> you know? Because I didn't want to throw her in some like, hey, I'm going to use her great acting skills for, you know, some crappy video that I shot or something, you know? So, um, so when you wrote the treatment for the video, did, did you have her in mind? Well, or did they write the treatment? They wrote the treatment and we kind of had a little bit of back and forth and then uh, um, I said, well, what if the character was a woman? And then I was like, I was, well, I was still feeling them out. And then when I did, I said, okay, check out Kira's IMDb and see, see if you like who she is because I think she'd be perfect. And they, they loved it and we had a, you know, they had a great experience. Uh, uh, Kira and the crew, I think, had a, a great experience together from what I understand. Yeah. So in general terms, yeah. In general terms, yeah. can you tell me what the video means? Well, the video, it's a it's a slow burn. Uh, it's not super dynamic, you know. It's just it's creepy in a very subtle way, and Kira's character is stuck in between life and death, and it's kind of uh, you know shown with the makeup she's wearing. She's kind of lost, and she's hunting down this other character, and she kills her with a you shovel. Just ruined it. <laughs> you don't have to show the video. <laughs> but you don't see anything. Right. And it's really it's the shot. The end game. The shots are beautiful. That that's not a reveal. It, during the bridge of the song, there's a scene where Kira's chasing her victim and. It gives me shivers. When I first saw the video, I teared up. Like, it's, it just hit the nail on the head for what I was hoping. They okay. did a really good job. Well, let's go to the video. This yes. This is Very Me, the new video from Actors.
Is there anything that you want to say to anyone out there about anything, about being a creator, about being somebody who makes art? I think do the work. Get up. Do it. I've talked to so many people that say, oh, I've got all these songs. They're half finished. Finish it. Don't be so precious. Do lots of work. Do lots of varying different things. Draw pictures, do videos, film, uh, learn different instruments, whatever the case is, it all enriches your art and, and um, just feel confident that what you're doing is good because if it's not good, you're going to get good. Right. And so people want to find you Jackknife Sound? Jackknifesound.com. Okay. Yep. And is it actors.com as well or is it all through Jackknife? Sound? You can reach me through jackknifesound.com for the studio and for what I do as a producer and a mixer. And then actors, you can just find us on Facebook. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.